we're going to talk about a pair of really important structures in the male reproductive system called the testes. They sit inside the scrotum and have two really primary functions. First, they produce the male's contribution to a baby, which is his sperm. Second, they make the majority of the major male hormone, testosterone. But we'll really only discuss the sperm production role for now. So let's look inside the testes and see what we find. So inside, we find this really convoluted set of tubes in light blue here. These are called seminiferous tubules. The sperm are actually made inside these tubules, and the testosterone is made by cells called Leydig cells that hang out on the outside of these tubules. Anyway, the sperm are made in the seminiferous tubules, and then they travel out of the tubules and into the epididymis to mature and get ready to head off via ejaculation to try to find an egg to fertilize. So, to appreciate the process of sperm production and how it all happens, we need to take a look inside the seminiferous tubules. So let's take a look inside. This is a cross-section of the tubule, sort of magnified so we could see the components a bit better. So this light blue layer along the top here is a muscle-like layer that, that helps to propel sperm through the tubules and into the epididymis. So it does this via sort of coordinated muscular contractions that move in a wave-like fashion down the tubes. The coordinated movement pattern is called peristalsis. So if you think about squeezing a tube of toothpaste from the bottom to the top to get a, a little bit of toothpaste out, peristalsis is pretty similar to that. So anyway, after leaving the seminiferous tubules, the sperm sort of drain out into this network of tubes here called the rete testis. Then, after the rete testis, they drain to the epididymis, where they hang out to mature and be stored for a while. So that's just a little bit on peristalsis and the movement of the sperm through the tubes. But back to the cross-section here. These radially arranged cells in a bit darker blue, they're called Sertoli cells. And just so you're aware, in reality, Sertoli cells are packed into these tubules in a way more crowded fashion. This is just an easy sort of schematic way of looking at them and, and, and seeing how they do what they do, which you'll soon see. So the general idea is that sperm develop between two Sertoli cells. And they sort of develop as they shuffle down between the two cells toward the lumen here. By the way, a lumen is a hole down the center of a hollow tube. So, for example, the lumen of a garden hose is the part where the water travels through. So let's get to the details of how this all happens. We'll zoom in here on, say, this part here, but we really could pick anywhere along these tubes because it's all the same process. And let's say this here is a Sertoli cell, and then there's a Sertoli cell on the other side, but I'll, I'll just put S to designate Sertoli cell. And that light blue bit up top is that smooth muscle layer that, that does peristalsis. So this purple cell here, what is that? That's called a spermatogonium. And you have these spermatogonium between each set of neighboring Sertoli cells. They're sort of the precursor to the mature form of sperm. They're the actual germ cell where all our sperm comes from. So they go through different developmental stages in, uh, in a process called differentiation until they form what we know as sperm. So immediately you might think, well, what if these spermatogonium are differentiating down the pathway to become mature sperm? What happens when they all do that? Won't we run out of spermatogonium? And that's a great thought. So how that problem is solved is that when spermatogonium undergo mitosis and split into two spermatogonium, one will differentiate into the next precursor sperm cell down the pathway of making mature sperm, and the other one will just keep being a spermatogonium. So it'll give rise to another two cells, and one will differentiate, and one will keep being a spermatogonium, and so on. So let's officially start here. Our spermatogonium will divide via mitosis, and one of the daughter cells will differentiate into a primary spermatocyte. Uh, and we'll just draw that one. Remember, the other is going to revert back to being a germ cell, a spermatogonium. So this primary spermatocyte here has to cross over this linkage between the two Sertoli cells, that's called a tight junction. And the tight junction effectively creates two compartments. One up here, that's called the basal compartment. Basal because it's closest to the base or the basal region of the Sertoli cells. And one compartment down here called the luminal compartment. 
because it includes that lumen we mentioned earlier. So because they're really tightly separated by the, by the tight junction here, these two different compartments have really different chemical environments. They have different signaling molecules and proteins floating around in them, and, and that helps each compartment to bring on a different stage of development for our developing sperm. Anyway, back to the tight junction. It sort of senses the primary spermatocyte coming close, and it, and it opens up and the primary spermatocyte moves through and starts to enlarge by increasing its cytoplasm because it's actually getting ready to divide and differentiate into, into two secondary spermatocytes. And then that tight junction actually reforms super quickly behind it, like before the primary spermatocyte is even fully through. And the idea behind that quick reformation of the tight junction is so that you don't get much leakage from one compartment into the other so that their environments can stay pretty different to each other. So back to our primary spermatocyte. It's passed through the tight junction now, and it hasn't really changed except enlarging a little bit by gaining more cytoplasm. So now it divides and differentiates into two secondary spermatocytes. But there's actually a pretty big difference between the division that the spermatogonium did to produce the primary spermatocyte and the new spermatogonium. That division was by mitosis, and this division, where the primary spermatocyte divides to create two secondary spermatocytes, this is called meiosis. So they sound similar, mitosis, meiosis, but in mitosis, you enlarge and split into two identical daughter cells that are genetically identical to the original cell. But in meiosis, you give each of your daughter cells half of your chromosomes. So each primary spermatocyte has 23 pairs of chromosomes, and each chromosome is a pair of sister chromatids. And you probably notice that these chromosomes have all undergone crossing over. They're a mixture of pink and blue from homologous chromosomes from mom and dad. So just a reminder that yes, primary spermatocytes were created from spermatogonia by mitosis, but at a certain point, the primary spermatocytes decide to undergo meiosis. So prophase 1 starts in these primary spermatocytes, and crossing over happens in these primary spermatocytes. And then metaphase 1 and anaphase 1 and telophase 1 and cytokinesis happen to split our primary into two secondary spermatocytes. So when the primary spermatocytes differentiate into secondary spermatocytes, they give each of their daughter cells a half of their chromosomes. So now each secondary has 23 chromosomes, still with a sister chromatid each. So now what happens? Well, we have our secondary spermatocytes, each having 23 chromosomes in sister chromatid configuration, and now they need to differentiate. So they do. They differentiate into spermatids, which are starting to look something like sperm and two spermatids per secondary spermatocyte are created. So there would be four here, but I've only drawn in uh, the, sperma the spermatids from one of the secondaries. I've only drawn two in. And notice that these spermatids, they're a little bit more embedded into the Sertoli cells. They, they get a lot of nutrients that way. Importantly though, when they differentiate from secondary spermatocytes to spermatids, the second half of meiosis happens, what's called meiosis 2. So meiosis 1 was completed earlier when we went from primary spermatocytes to secondary spermatocytes. And by undergoing the second step of meiosis here, we further reduce the chromosome copy number by half. So instead of 23 chromosomes, each with a sister chromatid, these newly made spermatids each have 23 single copies of each chromosome. And we need sperm to have only one copy of each chromosome, because after a sperm fertilizes a female's egg, the eggs end up with also only one copy of each chromosome. So when their nuclei fuse, they create a set of 23 pairs of chromosomes, one set from the father's sperm and one set from the mother's egg. And that's what we want. So now for the last step that happens in between the Sertoli cells. The spermatids differentiate into spermatozoa, one spermatozoa per spermatid, in a process called spermiogenesis. And each spermatozoa has a single copy of each chromosome. So notice that one primary spermatocyte ends up giving rise to four sperm. Remember, what you see here should actually be doubled, so you should see two more spermatozoa.
because I've only shown the products of one of the secondary spermatocytes. So down here at the newly minted sperm stage, we're not exactly done yet. The immature sperm still have to travel to the epididymis to mature into sperm that are fully capable of carrying out fertilization. So in the epididymis, they gain more mitochondria and they gain longer flagellae. And, and at that point, they're ready to start their journey in the hopes of fertilizing an egg. 